formed and in a sense Palestine begins to disappear and that's obviously a really important date and then going to fast forward to the one in the middle which we just gone by 1967 when Israel goes to war with many of the Arab states including Egypt and takes even more land um, and ends up in 2013 where we are now this gives you a very good picture of more or less where we're at with the green bits are the Palestinian bits and the rest are the Israeli bits. So this is both kind of geography and history all wrapped up together and of course part of the politics. Now, let's go back to 1948 when in one way it all begins, in fact it begins before then, but 1948 is an incredibly important year. One, because that's when Israel is founded, recognized as a nation state. And at the same time, and because of, Palestine begins to disappear. Most importantly for the Palestinians, Nearly a million of them leave what becomes Israel. They leave their villages and their homes to create what both sides agree is a refugee crisis, but both sides disagree very strongly about both its causes. And the Palestinians will say they were essentially kicked out, they were excluded, and the Israelis will say they left with their own accord. We'll come back to that shortly. That's a very important moment in terms of the emergence of one nation and the beginnings of the destruction of another. But let's go back a little bit further back in history. And this is going to be, I'm going to try and stick, I'm going to insist, I'm going to make sure I stick to this the time limit. I've got two clocks there, so I can't really go wrong. So we're going to try and finish at 44, 24? 44. Um, so it's a little bit in headlines, um, but nevertheless, so we're going, I'm going to get as much across as I possibly can. Jewish settlement in Palestine, and the Jewish settlements become Israel, we call it Zionism. Jews who believe in this call it Zionism. And most of the Jews that settled in Palestine came from the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th century, which is an enormous empire where more than half the world's Jewish population lived. And those Jews suffered from what they call anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish racism, severe pogroms, killings on a mass scale. And they looked for alternatives. There were three alternatives those Jews faced. One was to resist, to fight back, and many did. Another was to migrate, and many migrated. Not to Palestine, most migrated to Western Europe and America in particular. As a matter of fact, the American Jewish population today is the largest Jewish population in the world, not in Israel. And the vast majority of those American Jews, their grandfathers and great-grandparents, came from Russia getting away from that anti-Jewish racism at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. A tiny minority of those same Jews came to Palestine, believing in one version of the Bible, and I stress this, it's a different talk, interesting though it is, one version of the Bible that they said made them, gave them a religious and a political and historical claim on the land of Palestine. Because they said, the origins of our religion, the Jewish religion, are in Palestine, therefore we can create a modern nation there. But that's clearly an extremely contentious uh, a, a statement and hypothesis, and we can discuss it in, in, a, a, a later on. But that's what they believe, and that's the reason they went there. And superficially, it was a very attractive idea. After all, you're getting away from racism, you want to go to the land where your religion was born, why not? What's wrong with it? And in principle, there's nothing wrong with it except for one thing. When the Jewish migrants arrived in Palestine, say at the beginning of the last century, in 1900, for example, they discovered lots of other people living there. And this created a problem. Lots of the Jews arriving didn't know anyone else was living there. Once they discovered there was, some left. Others thought we should work alongside our neighbours, but others thought we're rather more important than people that we've just suddenly met in Palestine, we're going to create our own nation just for us. And that became Zionism. And I think you can see a problem with that approach. But there's something else that's equally important. This wasn't just about migration from one part of the world to another. It was about settling those migrants to become a new nation. And to do that, they needed a sponsor. They needed what I call a great power sponsor. They needed one of the great powers of the world at the beginning of the last century to support them. And the leaders of that migratory movement, they went to Russia, they went to Turkey, they went everywhere. But guess who gave them support in the end? Good old Britain, the good old British Empire. And the good old British Empire dominated this whole part of the world immediately after World War I. 
World War I finished, hope you all know, in 1918. In 1970, a leading government minister in the war cabinet called Balfour declared that we've just occupied what they like to call the Holy Land. That's a rather contentious word as well. I'm going to call it Palestine for most of this talk. The British Empire expanded after World War I to include Palestine, and Britain very kindly offered at least parts of Palestine to those Jewish migrants. The British government concluded with this man called Balfour, this minister called Balfour, who signed something called the Balfour Declaration, which is like the foundation document of the Israeli state. They said, you can have a Jewish state in Palestine as part of the British Empire. And that's precisely what began to happen. Um, we go back to 1948, we go back to when it was uh, all green. Well, in one sense, you could, you could cover it with a Union Jack. If we were doing this map back to the beginning of the 20th century, or at least back to 1917, <laughs> 1918, you could cover it, you could actually expand this kind of approach by having a map of Palestine covered with a Union Jack, cover, covered with British rule. Because the British, the Brits, British government ruled it from 1918 till 1948, and increasingly allowed more and more Jewish migrants to come to Palestine. And all those Jewish migrants who came there took the British government at its word, said we're going to create a Jewish homeland for ourselves. And they took for granted a Jewish homeland meant a Jewish state for ourselves. What about the Arab population getting more and more restless, getting more and more angry? Well, all sorts of kind words were said about the Arab population, but increasingly the Arab population realised it was essentially a confidence trick. That although they were told by government ministers like Balfour and in Churchill, other famous names of early British 20th century history, that they were going to, the Arab population would be looked after, they wouldn't lose out as a result of this increasing migration. The fact is, it became increasingly clear they were losing out. For example, everybody knows about the, the exclusion of the Palestinians today, but even in those very early days, absentee landlords sold land with Palestinian peasants working the land, sold that land to Jewish landlords. And then the Palestinian peasants were then kicked off. That had a kind of spurious legal protection, but the beginnings of the problem are there by definition. If you start throwing, Palestin you start throwing peasants off their land, they're going to resent it when they've been there for centuries and centuries, taking it for granted it's their farms and so on. That's precisely what began to happen a very long time ago. I mean, now I'm thinking back roughly 100 years ago, uh, let's just 90 years ago, this began to happen. Uh, and it increasingly went on happening throughout the 20th century, even before the Second World War. Oh, we simply lost the map, never mind. Um, you can all imagine, you've all seen the map going <coughs> forward and backwards. Um, okay, so. This is the background. Two points to remember then. This Jewish migration on the one hand, fleeing racism, and the great power sponsorship on the other hand. And hence the responsibility in the first half of the 20th century of Britain for creating what's become one of the most difficult problems to solve in, in, in the world in the 21st century begins with the British Empire having this expansionary policy. And just in passing, it's rather, in some ways, it's similar to South Africa and Ireland, where also you had entrenched colonial settler populations as part of the British Empire who didn't want to give up their privileges. Now there are differences, but there are also some similarities. Perhaps we can return to similarities in the discussion. Now I'm going to move a little bit more quickly because I'm conscious of the time. Coming right up to 1948. 1948, Britain's won again with America and with Russia. They've won the Second World War. But basically the empire is falling to pieces. I'm sure people know about it, especially India becomes independent. And there's a, tr and, and, and there's a tremendous clamour, quite rightly, for independence from the British Empire in the former colonies. Not least in Palestine. But in Palestine the complication was, you have two groups wanting independence. You have the Palestinians on the one hand, and they had the, what were becoming the Israeli Jews on the other hand. And they were both fighting the British Empire, but they were also fighting each other. And essentially, the British government, to put it bluntly, washed its hands of the problem. They walked away. Or are they handed to the United Nations? And if, we've lost the map, but you can remember perhaps that one of the maps showed the United Nations partition plan. One idea was to partition Palestine on a 45-55% basis. 
Um, and that may or may not have worked. It's impossible to know because it was never given an opportunity to work. Incidentally, partition wasn't. Partition might sound fair, but if you think about other former colonial states, like, for example, South Africa, partition isn't usually the best idea. The best idea is to let the people who've been the subjects of empire to take control of their own lives in their own country. That's by far the best way, and that was also an option that was available for an independent Palestine, including both its Arab and Jewish, its, its, its Muslim, its Christian, its Jewish by religion citizens. That was an option. It's even today still an option. We'll come back to it. But partition was favoured, but it didn't work. And there was a war, uh, which Israel, its foundation, certainly won from its own point of view, as I said at the beginning. One of the results of that war was the exclusion of the majority of the Palestinians in, from native Palestine. They call it Nakba in Arabic, catastrophe. And for them it was a catastrophe. Now, uh, I'm going to move to the second main year, 1967. 1967, Israel went to war with many of its Arab neighbours, especially with Egypt. And it's, again, it's a, a talk in itself. But Israel won that war because it got support from, this time, another great power, the United States. And uh, it expanded even further. People may know, you may know, what we today call Gaza, West Bank, and parts of the Sinai Desert all became part of Greater Israel after 1967. And that began in many ways, two, two, two developments. Israel, until that point, had a great deal of sympathy around the world. But then people began to realise, lots of people around the world began to realise, something was wrong. This was an aggressive expansionist state. This was not simply about people fleeing racism any longer. It was about something much more than that. It had become a, a, a part of an aggressive a, 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 a approach to politics. And the link with America becomes incredibly important. Because from 1967 onwards, the United States begins to pump huge sums of money into Israel, both in terms of funding for, the, for its economy, but more importantly for its military. And increasingly, it, it makes sense to talk about United States, uh, United States Israel. Almost so Israel is like the six, 60th or 61st state of the United States. They're incredibly closely linked. Their, their, their military and defense departments are closely linked. Their, their science and technology and uh, high-tech and biotech <coughs> uh, uh, science research units in different universities are very closely linked. And in many ways, there's an argument about why this is, uh, why the United States and Israel are so closely linked. My own view, following a very important, very radical American Jewish intellectual called Chomsky, who argues, I think very convincingly, that Israel became what he called a strategic asset, asset for the United States. Or to put it another way, there was a very famous United States president called Ronald Reagan. You may have heard of him in the early 1980s. And Ronald Reagan had a defense secretary called Alexandra Haig. And Alexandra Haig described Israel as a semi-landlocked warship for the United States. That's an extraordinary image when you think about it. A semi-landlocked warship for the United States. What does that mean? It means that from a United States military perspective, from a United States economic perspective, Israel was serving America's interests, the United States' interests, in, in the Middle East. And... Uh, that's certainly an explanation which I favour, and um, it seems to fit. And also, it throws into question whether, if that's true, if the United States and Israel are so closely intertwined, can the United States at the same time be an honest broker between the two sides? Can it be an interlocutor? Can it help make peace? And I'm going to move to the question of making peace, because I'm about halfway through the talk. So, bearing what I said in mind, let's now talk about what does peace look like? First of all, we need to begin from the point of view, the perspective of the Palestinians themselves. And they have three main demands. They have the demand to um, withdraw, uh, uh, get rid of those uh, uh, settlements, the occupied parts of uh, the West Bank that have set Israeli settlers on them. As a matter of fact, there's nearly half a million Israeli settlers on the West Bank, on that part, that tiny portion of Palestine that you saw that was getting smaller and smaller from 1967 to 2013. Um, there was something called the Oslo Peace Accords that were signed um, in 1993. And those peace accords between Israel and Palestine, they didn't begin to talk to each other. Those peace accords included the disbanding of those settlements. But it's gone the other way, very simply. In the year 2000, 
There are 200,000 Israeli Jewish settlers on the West Bank of Palestine, and today there's nearly half a million. So Israel ignored completely those peace accords. But nevertheless, the first demand for Palestinians is to disband the settlements. And incidentally, I talked about the United Nations. I should have spent a little bit more time on that. The United Nations partition plan failed, and although the United Nations historically has developed policies which seem very fair to the Palestinians, and not, not least insist in Israel withdraw to its 1967 borders, unfortunately, most times the United, United Nations policy fails. Also, there's United Nations resolutions on those self-state refugees who led to 1948. The United Nations resolutions insisting those refugees can go back to their towns and villages. I talked about three demands of Palestinians. The first one, get rid of the settlements on the West Bank. Two, share Jerusalem. Now just think about Jerusalem. This is the most extraordinary city. I've had the good fortune to visit it many times. This is a city where three great religions can equally claim a sort of religious uh, and historical and cultural heritage. Judaism, Christianity and Islam in order of their development historically. All three of those great religions, first of all, have a very strong religious presence in the city. But the people that live there, whether they're religious or not, mainly 99% claim a religious heritage from those three great religions. So there's a very simple solution. The three religions should share the city. It's quite obvious. The peoples who are connected to the three religions should share the city. That seems to be obvious. That's a demand of the Palestinians. But the Israelis say no. The Israelis say it's been the undivided Jewish capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. This is the one of the things that uh, has stimulated me to write a book about it. That's such nonsense. Uh, it's extraordinary that an Israeli leader appears to be a superficially intelligent man who makes such uh, ludicrous claims, and it's not so difficult to unpick and challenge those claims, and indeed there are some very courageous Israeli, I repeat, Israeli archaeologists who've laid into Netanyahu, the present Israeli Prime Minister, to demonstrate this is complete rubbish. But in any case, on a simple basis of fairness, on any kind of civilizational norms, of what we expect great world cities to look like, and of course Jerusalem is a great world city, um, then the three peoples derived from the three religions should live equally together. That's the second demand of the Palestinians. The third demand of the Palestinians is for the refugees to be allowed to return to their towns and villages. Israel refuses to talk about those last two items uh, at all. That's called one of the reasons why the peace process has stalled. And so the question is, if Israel is refusing to talk, how do you force Israel to talk? And most people historically have looked to America to provide the kind of pressure to get Israel to talk. And everybody, including myself, I have to admit, was very excited when, for the first time in American history, a black president was elected. Not only a black president being elected, uh, uh, Barack Obama, but one who was making the most progressive noises about Israel, uh, 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 much more than any other previous United States president. He went out of his way, for example, people I'm sure you all know, the levels of Islamophobia, hatred towards Muslims, which developed throughout the first part of this century. Obama went out of his way to make, put a hand of friendship to the Muslim peoples of the Middle East. He made a speech in Egypt at the beginning of his presidency, where he went out of his way to talk about the need. After all, he won the election on getting troops out of Iraq uh, and uh, condemning George Bush's earlier policies. And it's a very powerful speech, and everyone thought part of that speech, and he said so himself, had to be about making peace with Israel. And yet, if you follow his career for the first part of his presidency, or out to the second part of his presidency, frankly, he did absolutely nothing. He might have made the right noises, but nothing changed. And there's a very simple test. Every American president, and, but incidentally, why America is so important is for the reason I gave before. America has an enormous influence in Israel. Israel could not appear so strong militarily and politically were it not for the support the United States gives it. So this, is a two, this, is, this works both ways. It also means the United States, if it wants to, can put massive pressure on Israel to start to change its policies. But frankly, Obama hasn't done that. And I was going to say the test is over the settlements. Israel's gone on expanding those settlements on the West Bank throughout the century for the last 13 years, since the Oslo Accords of 93, it's 20 years now they've gone on expanding those settlements, despite a peace agreement that says they're not supposed to. There's absolutely no question that uh, the United States could instruct Israel to stop doing it, but it doesn't do so. Uh, and Obama's now going to go, he's going to Israel very shortly, 
and expectations are rising in his second term, he's finally going to start putting pressure on. Well, don't hold your breath. I don't think it's going to happen. Again, he's going to make some noises which sound very attractive and impressive, but nothing much is going to change. So if, it is, if, if the Palestinians can't rely on America, who can they rely on? Uh, well, this is a very important question. The first answer is themselves. They have to rely on themselves alone. And in many ways, that's exactly what they've done. And they fought a very, very courageous battle. When I was roughly your age, which is a very long time ago in the middle part of the last century, the word Palestine had hardly, everyone, hardly anyone ever talked about it. There's a big change taking place. As a result of the Palestinian struggle, for many years they launched organised what they called the arms struggle. But they took up arms against Israel and attempted to get their land back through the use of the gun. Uh, Yasser Arafat, the famous Palestinian leader, the first Palestinian leader, appeared in the United Nations with a, with a gun in one hand and an olive branch in, in another, saying, I come here both as a diplomat but also as an armed fighter. And it was an amazing appearance and it caught the imagination of the world. But the tragedy for the Palestinians is both of those approaches have failed. The armed struggle was defeated, even though not just the armed struggle, the uh, Palestinians have organized two what they call intifadas, uprisings against Israel, one in 1987, two in 2000. And even they, although they shook Israel, they didn't have the same effects as other anti-colonial revolts had, say, for example, in Africa or in India, which finally ejected the, the, the British, this is not sufficient to either eject the Israelis or make the Israelis change their tune. And so the Palestinians reluctantly had to conclude they couldn't win by themselves. And you can understand why, because they aren't just fighting Israel, they're fighting United States Israel, much more difficult, in fact impossible. So they need allies. I'm going to spend the last five minutes talking about the kind of allies that they need. The first obvious ally for the Palestinians is the rest of the Arab world. After all, one thing the map doesn't make clear is that Palestine is part of an enormous part of what we call here the Middle East, the Arab world, which is huge. It stretches right across North Africa, Morocco, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, and so on. Yemen, uh, the Gulf states, it's absolutely enormous, talking about more than uh, 200 million uh, Arab people, who if they were mobilized as a bloc, could quite obviously uh, make Israel change its tune. Unfortunately, over the years, and again, it's almost a different meeting, the leaders of the Arab states have tended to adapt to United States policies, especially in the last 20 to 30 years, that's especially the case. And that's made it much more difficult for the people in the Arab world to give support to the Palestinians the way they'd like to, because you talk to any Arab person, any Arab person, I'll make, I'll make a, a prediction, you will not find an Arab anywhere who does not support the Palestinians, and it's very hard to find an Arab anywhere who supports the Israelis. There's a tiny number, but I go as far as say 95 to 99% of Arab people are on the side of the Palestinians and are incredibly hostile to Israel. So here's an enormous uh, a, a pool of support um, for, the, uh, uh, for the Palestinians, and they need to tap into it. Well, there's one way they can tap into it, and again, it's almost a different, uh, it's a different talk, but you may know something called about the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring is an incredibly important historical development, historical event. It began with a Tunisian trader setting himself on fire and committing suicide because he had enough of the oppression and the poverty and the degradation he and his family were living through, and this triggered kind of uprisings right throughout, throughout the Arab world, the most important of which is Egypt. And historically, Egypt has been the one country likely to give the most support to the Palestinians. For 30 years, its leader had a peace agreement with Israel and with America. But now, in Egypt's in a tremendous state of flux, and it's unnerved the Israelis, and it's given renewed hope to the, uh, to the Palestinians. Israel recently threatened to invade Gaza, and literally thousands of Egyptians poured in just across that border, because border, Gaza shares a border with Egypt, poured into Gaza to give support to the Palestinians inside Gaza. So here's a fantastically important uh, 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 um, pool of support for the Palestinians, the Arab world in general, and what I'll call the Egyptian revolution in particular. And this is ongoing. This, what happens in Egypt decisively affects the outcome in Palestine. But something else has developed uh, in, in recent uh, years, um, which is well worth knowing about, which is based in the rest of the world. There's a, you know, when the Palestinians were kicked out of um, Israel in 1948, they developed something called the diaspora, which is mainly refugees around Palestine. But there's now a global diaspora. There's now Palestinians are present. There may even be Palestinian students here. I have no idea. There are certainly Palestinian students on British campuses and universities. 
And they have helped bring about another type of solidarity, which has, which has a, an, 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 an acronym, acronym rather, not an acronym, acronym, three letters, B, D, S, Boycott, Disinvestment, Sanctions. And this follows the model of resistance to apartheid South Africa. And many people are saying, even some Israelis, even an Israeli Prime Minister called Olmert, worried about it, that Israel's become so much like South Africa, it makes sense to talk about Israeli apartheid. And if it is Israeli apartheid, then the methods used to get rid of South African apartheid also apply. And boycott disinvestment sanctions sounds like one of the ways to do this. And it means what it says. It means you persuade British companies, for example, if you're here, not to invest in Israel. Um, you persuade British shoppers not to buy Israeli goods. And there's lots of ways you can apply this, and we can talk about it. But it's a further form of pressure. So there are two forms of pressure on the Israelis, both of which we can say are forms of solidarity with the Palestinians in their struggle to bring about a very different situation. But I'll end on this. This talk was called The Road to Peace. And that's what I believe is the route to peace if America is unable or unwilling to put the kind of pressure on Israel to force Israel to begin serious negotiations with the Palestinians. And the Palestinians have no choice but to mobilize global support in the Arab world in particular, but around the world in general, to bring maximum pressure to bear on Israel so it begins to change its tune. I was at a meeting on Saturday, as a matter of fact, and there's a young Israeli on the platform with me, who was a progressive Israeli supporting Palestine. And he was praising the people in the meeting who had applied the boycott, disinvestment, sanctions policies, saying it's having an effect. And he described the way in which an Israeli government recently uh, commissioned a report. Uh, and although the economic effects of sanctions is very limited, what I call the ideological effect, the effect in people's heads, is enormous. Israelis are beginning to feel the sense of isolation around the world. And what was worrying the Israeli government ministers, to, to use the word that they used, the effect of boycott, disinvestment and sanctions, is to use their word, the Israeli word, is delegitimizing the Israeli state. Think about that word. Delegitimizing the Israeli state, making it not legitimate anymore. That's very worrying for the Israelis. If that's becoming true, because they depend very heavily on Western support. So the pressure is on, and it demonstrates once more that all of us together can begin to change the world. It's a very good place to change it. Thank you. I talk about water, of course I forgot, but I have brought a document about water and the way the Israelis pinch all the water from the West Bank and uh, this will be available if anybody wants it afterwards and there's a website you can go and visit as well. Any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your Yeah, the, the most terrifying uh, vision is that the Palestinians end up like the Native Americans. They're kind of reduced to kind of, um, many more are excluded, and a few are retained as kind of uh, for tourists to go and buy Palestinian heritage uh, uh, garments from. That's the most terrifying and most pessimistic vision. I don't share it myself. I think a much more likely outcome, because that's, that's, that's got a long history in the past. Um, a, a much more likely outcome is to look at the, 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 the pattern of anti-colonial resistance in the 20th century, not least against the British Empire. And it's been successful, if you think about it. I mean, if you think about most of Africa, most of the Middle East, most of the Indian subcontinent was in the colours of Britain. Um, for a very long period, because the British controlled it through the British Empire. That all changed. It changed in the 20th century. It changed mainly as a result of resistance. And although the Israel-Palestine conflict has kind of unique sort of difficulties, some of which I've described, in the end it's no different. And one thing that's clear about the Palestinians, they don't give up. They go on fighting, and you can understand the reasons for it. And even if one generation gets exhausted, 
they're having these other generations following in their tracks to take over. That's exactly what happens. I mean, people complain about the present Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas, because he's been far too friendly but to the Americans and the Israelis, but he has a political movement called Al Fatah. And Fatah youth were demonstrating on the streets when Israel went into Gaza just a few months ago, onto the borders of Gaza. Those Fatah youngsters in Ramallah and all the other major cities of the West Bank were on the streets complaining not just about Israel, but about their own conservative leaders. So this is not going to go away. The Palestinians will go on fighting. They'll find, they'll find ways of resisting new ways, original ways, new kinds of allies. Uh, possibly we can't even imagine at the moment, but they were gone resisting till, uh, till they, they get their freedom, because that's what people have to do. Um, a little point that I feel like you that we haven't really touched on is the, you said that the US and Israel obviously have a very important alliance, but also um, I think it's quite important to consider the fact that, I'm, I mean I have empathies on both sides to be honest, but we have had you know, there is a much aggression from outside in the Arab world towards Israel, which I think needs to be considered when, you know, when we're considering a peace process. There is aggression towards Israel as well from the outside. And so, actually, I do think that, that much of the war that the US has had with the Arab states, and actually with Iran especially, has caused a lot of the trouble, which means it's very, it's very hard to kind of say, yes, fine, like, do you not think that's important? Yeah, I do think it's important. The trouble is, it's, it's, it's a kind of chicken and the egg problem, yes. is that um, the, the Jewish settlements, when they became armed and began to demand more and more territory, understandably created a huge amount of hostility in the Arab world. And that is terribly sad for another reason, which is everyone takes for granted Jews and Arabs don't get on together. Jews and Muslims don't get on together. But that's historically not the case. First of all, the two religions in many ways are quite similar, and they, they, they share, from, from their perspectives, the same root, what they both call Abrahamic religions, looking at the inquest of the Prophet Abraham and so on. And, and, and in many ways, the religions are quite intertwined. But more importantly, I think, over the centuries, in the Arab world in particular, and also in Iran, Jews and Muslims lived side by side very successfully. There wasn't the kind of enmity and viciousness that developed in the 20th century. So that's a fact that has to also be borne in mind. So I think that although you're right, there's a lot of aggression towards Israel, in a way it's partly as a result of the West giving so much support for Israel, creating this nation state in Palestine and excluding the Palestinians. Had the Israelis very early on allowed the refugees to come back. I mean, for example, Egypt's great leader, Nasser, very early on wanted to do a peace deal with Israel, very early in the 1950s. And the Israel didn't want this peace agreement. But had that happened, the outcome could have been very, very different. So although I agree with you, lots of aggression towards Israel, I think Israel itself and its Western supporters must share a great part of the responsibility. Um, yeah, but don't you think that, sorry to go on, but no, no, go this, on. This, 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 this situation that we have between Israel and, Amer and the US and now the, the situation that we have between the US and Iran, don't you think that America is possibly manipulating that situation much more than it seems evident mm -hmm. to become, to, to, keep the, to keep that power? Yeah, I think that's totally yeah. possible, yes. Yeah. Yes, I do think that. Yeah. Um, how would you describe Hamas? Would you describe it as a terrorist organization? No. Or would you describe it as um, a resistant force against the Israeli I regard Hamas as a resistance movement, and I'll explain why. Um, one of the... One of the, one of the um, I don't have time to go into it, because obviously it's a complicated history. But one of the characteristics, one of the results of Israel's defeat of the Arab world, Israel's victory in the Arab world in 1967, was to demoralize what had become known as Arab radical nationalism of which Nasser's Egypt, Egypt Nasser was the most important exponent. At the same time, Soviet communism was clearly failing, and Islam became a political movement. Um, whether religions suit becoming political movements is an open question. After all, Zionism, rather similarly, is a political movement of the Jewish people. And some, some, not all, some religious Jews insist that Zionism is a, is a natural outgrowth of the Jewish religion. I don't believe that myself, but some Jews do believe that. But it was inevitable in some ways that in response, many Muslims would, would see their religion as a political movement. And clearly that's what's happened with Hamas. And Hamas has become a movement of resistance. Um, I don't accept the word terrorist. I mean, they call Nelson Mandela a terrorist. 
um, except that when he was released from jail and uh, headed the South African nation after its first election, began President Mandela, everybody in the world fated him. I mean, the Brits, who called him a terrorist, couldn't wait to invite him to Britain. Um, as, as the great new president, President Mandela. So Hamas today is terrorist. Hamas tomorrow could be a friend. Incidentally, we saw it in Ireland. I used the an analogy with Ireland earlier on. I mean, who would have imagined? I don't know how familiar you are with this. The most unlikely partnership, believe me, is Ian Paisley of the Protestants sitting down with Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness of the Irish Republican Army, all of whom are Catholics, and in quotes, making peace under tremendous, tremendous amount of pressure, and they're in a government together, or at least they were. Well, if that can happen between Paisley, an extreme Protestant, and uh, McGuinness and Adams uh, of a so called terrorist IRA, uh, uh, Irish Republican Army, it can certainly happen between uh, Hamas and the Israelis. As a matter of fact, um, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that Hamas is ready to, to talk. In fact, we may know there are unity negotiations going on with Fatah. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that they're ready to talk with the Israelis. The Israelis don't want to talk with them. And that's why America is so important, because America should put pressure on them. If America doesn't put pressure on them, then, as I say, other, other, other means are going to have to be used to get the results that we want to see. What's America's interest in the whole Palestinian situation? In the America's interest? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, going right back now to the early part, to the middle part of the 20th century, or to the early part of the 20th century, the, the, the world's energy supplies still come from most of the Middle East, Middle East oil wells. Even now, there's an attempt to get away from oil. Even today, oil is incredibly important. And the United States wants to control what happens to the oil, not just oil it gets, but oil to other countries around the world. And I think that it sees, I'm here very much going by the person I mentioned before, Chomsky, this American Jewish intellectual, who wrote where well, I got on the greatest books on the subject called United States, Israel, Palestine, it's almost certainly in your library, if not, please do order it. It gives a detailed explanation of how the Middle East oil supplies, mainly in Arab and Iran, Arab countries and Iran, um, require the United States to have tight control militarily on the region, and Israel has kind of served a kind of, a, 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 a served as a kind of policeman for American interests, and I think that's correct. I used the phrase strategic asset. I think that's exactly what Israel became for the United States in the latter part of the last century. Yeah. Without America, do you think Israel could do anything? No, is a short answer. <laughs> it's always had a great power sponsor. If you look at the history, for the per first half of the 20th century, Britain was its sponsor. For the second half of the 20th century until now, America is its sponsor. Um, if you didn't have an outside sponsor, then more or less both sides, you know, in, in terms of numbers, they're equally matched. Roughly speaking, there are more Palestinians. Um, but the numbers are you know, sort of similar. Um, but if you look at the, the equipment, when Israel goes to war with Palestine, the Palestinians, if they're lucky, have handheld rocket launch launches, and the, Ameri the Israelis have got the most sophisticated American aircraft, they've got drones, they've got every conceivable, horrible, just thought about weapon produced in America, or increasingly produced in Israel, with a, with a combined United States-Israeli uh, research team. And of course it's completely unfair. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm chair, you're the chair. I do a big problem. Uh, even though political opinion seems to be saying it's always in favour of uh, Palestine, do you think um, public opinion, because recently, um, I don't know if they've been as the Trump seems to have demonised and the rocket that happened recently with Israel, yeah, that's a really good question. It's a huge difference. I mean, public opinion in the middle part of the last century was completely pro-Israel. As I say, no one even heard of Palestine. Now, there's absolutely, despite the television news coverage, which is horribly distorted, even so, enough gets through the television news for people to begin to change their mind. And there is now people, I mean, most people in Britain don't know much about it and care even less. But insofar as they know something, they will say, well, the, the Palestinians aren't being treated very fairly. We do believe in justice for Palestine. It's rather vague. But there's much more sense of sympathy for the Palestinians than before. And that's incredibly important that is built upon. So I do think it's a big change. But I do agree, Islamophobia, anti-Muslim racism is very dangerous and can undermine that support. Uh, because one of the one of the one of the uh, the most more unpleasant sides of Israeli propaganda is to label every Palestinian an Islamic terrorist. <laughs>
which is you know, just racist abuse, essentially, but unfortunately, some people believe it. Would you say that uh, Western nationalism is like, the cause for the uh, split of yeah. the situation in Israel? Western nationalism? Yeah, uh, I, do, I do think nationalism in the West, it's kind of, in, in a way, Israel imported a version of Western nationalism. Yeah. Um, there's, there's nothing in the Jewish religion that, makes, that made 20th century Jews suddenly want a Jewish nation. Uh, in fact, there's a lot in Jewish religion which says that they don't want a Jewish nation. Um, so this became a kind of adaptation, a borrowing from modern Western thought to put a kind of nation in the middle of Palestine. And uh, so I do think, yes, that, that that ideology is partly responsible for it. Um, but it cuts both ways, of course, because a people struggling to be free see a nation as, as a way to freedom, and the Palestinians certainly see their own nation as a way to freedom. The question is, can you have an Israeli nation and a Palestinian nation at the same time? Well, one way is through partition, that doesn't seem to be working, and so in the end, there has to be some kind of settlement, and I think, since if you look at the oppressor and the oppressed, in that situation, you've got an oppressor nation, Israel, and an oppressed nation, Palestine, well, the oppressed nation has to, in the end, has to win out, and the, oppre the peoples of the, oppress the oppressor nation have to come to terms, in the same way as most whites in South Africa, despite often being incredibly racist in the past, most whites, not all, but most whites in Africa have come to terms with black South Africa. I don't see why, in principle, most Israeli Jews have not come to terms with a, a genuinely free and independent democratic Palestine. I've got two questions. Um, do the Israelis um, kind of control the media in the Middle East? And do you think this will start another world war? Do you mean the media in Israel or the media here? Like, do you think they have a part to play in it? This, this, is, this is overstated. Um, the, 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 the Western media is sympathetic to Israel because Israel looks like a Western country. Um, it's got nothing to do with control as such. Um, at the same time, the journalists who work for the media, some of them are genuinely independent-minded. And if you, watch, if you watch good news programs, carefully, say, Channel 4 News, for example, I recommend Channel 4 News as the best news programme. It's the most detailed and the most independent. You will find something approaching a balanced approach. So you, on the news, in newspapers and on TV news, you can get some information, especially with the internet these days. It's very easy to get the information that you need. And I like, recommend one source, very simple to remember, the Electronic Intifada. If you just Google the words, Electronic Intifada is a superb uh, a news information service, service, service that Palestinians run themselves. In fact, many Western journalists also read to get the Palestinian point of view on the news. So I don't want to overstate the control of the news. Uh, it, in itself, it's not the reason for the problem. It, it is a problem, but it's not the main problem. And do you think it'll start? No, I don't. The, the, the media itself won't start a war, no. I don't no, think not the media, as in this whole situation. Mi misunderstandings can start a war. Um, but I, didn't, I never believed, and I still don't believe, either Israel or America will go to war with Iran. Uh, because it's very, very dangerous for both of them. Uh, one thing the map didn't show us was the Gulf. The oil tankers, when they take oil, both from Iraq and Iran, move through the Gulf, which is a, which is a waterway. Um, which um, both Israel, the Gulf states, Iraq and Iran all have access to. And Iran has made it very clear, which they can do, they'll close the Gulf immediately, which will send oil prices through the, through the sky and uh, terrify the whole of the world. And that's what Iran will do. And that's why, despite all the huffing and puffing, it's extremely unlikely there'll be a war. And if you notice, if you read it carefully, Israel makes all sorts of noises about going to war with Iran. Essentially, Obama said, don't you dare, and they didn't. Results were that the, the extreme right won, and uh, they being quite frank about uh, the, that they being quite frank about, about the fact that they don't want us to, as two state partition. They just want to run is Israeli nation. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's not quite true what you say. The extreme right didn't win decisively. There's a, 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 there's a slightly more, I don't want to call it liberal even, but a slightly less right wing grouping. Um, who's the leader, the name escapes me, but anyway, um, who's made slightly more 
this is the true noises. But generally, you're right. The drift in Israel is to the right. And you're certainly correct to say two, two states look less and less likely because Israel's gobbling up what's supposed to be the Palestinian state in the West Bank. But that raises a very interesting question, and I should have made more about it in my talk, is what the Palestinians do if they suddenly, if the leaders in particular, realize there isn't going to be a Palestinian state, what do they do? And this fits very much with what I was saying about the resistance. It seems to me that, I say it seems to me, this is what many Palestinians are now saying, um, they have to draw the lessons of the civil rights movement in America and the South African struggle and start to campaign for one person, one vote inside, in quotes, greater Israel. If Israel is insisting on gobbling up the whole of Palestine, then the Palestinians have to demand democracy inside greater Israel. Including, and this is crucial, including one person, one vote for all the refugees, the nearly six million of them in the refugee camps. And I think that will happen. It seems to me this is a, this has got a real headache now if it insists on gobbling up the whole of the West Bank and this civil rights movement takes off. The whole of the world will rally to them. It would be absolutely obvious that it's only fair if Israel, if Greater Israel controls Palestine, Palestinians have to demand one person, one vote inside Greater Israel, unless, of course, Israel tries to kick them out. And if that happens, then I do think uh, there will be some kind of world war. Um, the, like we saw the maps before, and we realised like that Palestine has such little land left, um, according to like compared to Israel. But what do like the Western people think about that? Because surely it's not a war anymore. Because such a majority like you can't. Yeah, it's not fair. Like there's a majority and there's a minority, and the majority is being supported by Western countries, whereas the minority is being supported by hardly anyone. Yeah, it is exactly as you say. It's really unfair. And as much as that, even the Oslo peace accords that Israel is ignoring, the Palestinians only got 22 percent, but roughly a quarter, just less than a quarter of original Palestine, and the Palestinians were prepared to accept that. Um, so even that was in 1993. But, but, but even that's now been overthrown um, with the expansion of the settlements on the West Bank. So you're absolutely wrong. It is incredibly unfair. Um, and, I, and I do think that unfairness is beginning to trickle into the public populations around the world. Um, it's far too slow, but I do think it's beginning to change. And um, it, can suddenly, it can suddenly accelerate. Um, but I think the unfairness, just the kind of elementary level of democracy and justice, is so obvious that people, most people don't want to think about it. People, people often say, ah, no one wants to know. Well, people don't know, people are ignorant. But the ignorance is often to do with people turn off politics, they really want to find out about it. People who do begin to find out about it are much more likely to take the Palestinian side because the unfairness is so gross. So I agree with you, but it is ignorance that makes it slow in terms of people realizing it. Um, considering that Jewish people are widely regarded as the most persecuted people in history, apart from women, possibly, um, do, you, do you think that Israel has a right to exist? I should have, what I should have mentioned, I should have mentioned the Nazi Holocaust um, as a key factor in the creation of the Israeli state in 1948. That was one of the greatest crimes against humanity, 11 million people were slaughtered, 6 million in, 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 in concentration camps, 6 million were Jews, and it's quite true what you say, especially in Europe, um, Jews were one of the most, if not the most persecuted minority over many, many centuries. So that makes a very, very powerful case for an independent Jewish state, there's no doubt about that, I was brought up with that belief, and was un you didn't question it, as a young Jew growing up in Britain in the middle part of the last century, it was unquestioned belief, it was so obvious. The problem is, that's only one side of the story. When you hear the other side of the story, bit by bit, when you hear the Palestinian case, you're stuck. You've got two cases which don't fit together. So I came to the conclusion, you have to take a decision, you have to make a choice uh, about what, what is just. And I came to the conclusion, uh, partly because I also became a socialist, I believe it was possible <coughs> to, for peoples to live together, even if they begin by being intensely hostile, even if you begin by one being an, an oppressor group which was itself oppressed, and you're absolutely right, the Jews were an oppressed group, one of the most oppressed groups for centuries, an oppressed group, nevertheless part of its population becomes an oppressor group against another oppressed peoples, my God, what a, what a mixture this is. Still, they have to find a way of living together. 
has to be a fight about creating conditions for freedom and for justice and for democracy, but that can be an equality that can be brought about. So I do think it's possible for many of those Jews who feel the world turned against them, especially in the Second World War under Hitler, and the world did seem to turn against them, their sons and daughters and their sons and daughters, they don't have to stay living in the past. Someone once said, don't let the scar do the work of the wound. It's a very, very potent image. And memory of the past is important, we have to move on. And we know we, we can look around the world and find much more civilised ways of living together and a, a, a vast improvement in the situation in Israel-Palestine. So I think a minority, minority only, a minority of Jews in Israel can be one to a fair solution. Um, and bit by bit, their sons and daughters and their sons and daughters can be one more successfully to a fair solution. But they have to come to terms with their Arab Muslim neighbours. This is an Arab Muslim part of the world. The vast majority of people in that part of the world are Arab Muslim. So they have to come to terms with that. I don't see why they can't. It's not beyond the realms of possibility. In, in some cases, uh, Arab Muslim people themselves have to change to accommodate these neighbours and all the rest of it. But come on. Human beings are flexible creatures under their political conditions, and it can happen. Um, do you think diplomatic talks will be enough to keep peace if it's kind of invasion? No, that's not about invasion, it has to be pressure, it has to be mass pressure from below. Diplomatic talks have been a fantastic failure. It has to be mass pressure from below. And the mass pressure from below I want to see is mass pressure from below from talks about the Egyptian Revolution, from ordinary people in the rest of the Arab world beginning to take up the Palestinian cause and making Israel realise they are they've got to come to terms with their Arab neighbours. Just in terms of the numbers, they have to realise this is an Arab part of the world, and they have to come to terms that they can't be a kind of Western enclave imposed on the Arab world. They have to come down and realise that they, they are they have to be equal citizens alongside their Arab neighbours. They have to find ways of doing that. However hard it is, politically, psychologically, that's what they have to do. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Just to put you by the Geojustice, the Richmond Trust, that's right, and didn't come along with Saturday time, Wednesday, next door. And if you have any issues that you think pertinent to your Jew from a geopolitical interest that you would like to bring up in college and start with the bar, then you can come along. And also, we have some journals on water resources in Israel, Palestine, which you can pick up on your way up. And this is where we some books. I'm not sure how much copies we have, but we can make copies and you can get it in your lesson, or you can come and pick one up from my mark. Well,